The Rules Committee will come to order. Today we will consider HR 89, uh, sorry, HR 8393, the Puerto Rico Status Act. This bill uh, details the transition to and implementation of a non-territory status for Puerto Rico. It tasks the Puerto Rico uh, State Elections Commission to carry out a nonpartisan campaign to educate and inform voters before holding a referendum for Puerto Rico to decide between statehood, independence, or independence followed by free association with the United States. Look, it's, it's simple. This legislation gives the people of Puerto Rico a choice, one that they deserve to determine their status. It's past time we provide them with this opportunity to carve their own path and build the future that they want. With that, I will turn to our ranking member, uh, Mr. Dr. Burgess, for any comments he wishes to make. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for yielding, and certainly I want to thank our witnesses for uh, being here with us today to lend their expertise and perspective on such an important matter as the current political status of Puerto Rico. We appreciate the time and expertise of our witness panel today. And Mr. Chairman, I do have to say, with only a few legislative days left in this Congress, no path forward in the Senate, I'm not sure why this matter warrants an emergency meeting of the Rules Committee when so many outstanding issues remain. This legislation, should it be signed into law, will have wide-ranging implications concerning matters of national sovereignty, taxation, and immigration. Grave matters that deserve input from all members of Congress, not just Democratic leadership in the Capitol. If Congress is going to legislate on statehood for the territory of Puerto Rico, we should at least afford members of Congress the opportunity to participate in the process. Unfortunately, as has been the case these past few months, the Democratic majority is continuing the trend of rubber stamping legislation that has no hope of making it to the President's desk. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, as has already been stated, the final product before us today was negotiated in a back room without transparency, without input from the minority. If this process had gone through regular order and this bill had the benefit of consulting the relevant stakeholders, this weakness concerning the implications would have led to a different conversation than the one that we are having right now. Simply put, this bill is not ready for prime time. I urge its rejection. I will yield back. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for your... Uh, your opening statement, I'll put you down as undecided um, on this bill. But just for the legislative history, um, for the record, on July 15, 2022, Chairman Grijalva introduced H.R. 8393, the Puerto Rico Status Act, with original co-sponsors, uh, Chairman Nidia Velasquez, Resident Commissioner Representative Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, and Representative Darren Soto. The Natural Resources Committee held a hearing on April 14th. 2021, um, entitled Insular Affairs Legislative Hearing on Puerto Rico Political Status, uh, and a, a hearing on June 16, 2021, entitled Office of Insular Affairs Legislative Hearing. On July 20, uh, 20th, 2022, the full committee met and held a markup of the bill and favorably reported it with an amendment in the nature of a substitute by a vote of 25 to 20, with Resident Commissioner Gonzalez Colon joining the majority. So I just wanted to put that in the record for uh, context. Uh, let me just say that I am, uh, want to welcome our, um, our witnesses today uh, on this bill, uh, Chairman Grijalva and Ranking Member Westerman. We are delighted that you are here. I now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Chairman Grijalva. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman McGovern, and to uh, Mr. Burgess. appreciate the opportunity to come before uh, the Rules Committee. You know, the uh, Puerto Rico Status Act uh, recognizes that Puerto Rico's current colonial status is unacceptable and undemocratic. And the bill represents an offer from Congress to the people of Puerto Rico to make an informed choice about their political future. Now, the people of Puerto Rico are going to have, must decide the island's political status. And Congress has the responsibility and the power to facilitate that process. Two pieces of legislation were introduced earlier this Congress with different mechanisms to resolve Puerto Rico's political status. H.R. 1522, the Puerto Rico Statehood Admissions Act, and H.R. 2070, the Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act of, 19, of 2021. The Natural Resources 
committee held two legislative hearings on these bills and the subject of Puerto Rico, uh, on the subject of the island's political status in April and June of uh, 2021, as, as the chairman indicated, which included witness panels of current and former elected officials, academic, uh, and academic and civil rights experts. With the guidance of the office of uh, Majority Leader Hoyer, the sponsors of the two bills, Representative Soto, Velasquez, Gonzalez Colon, and Ocasio-Cortez came together to combine elements of their respective bills to arrive at a compromise, and that would be supported by a majority of the members of Congress. The Bipartisan Puerto Rico Status Act, H.R. 8393, is a result of that effort. Uh, an effort that I might add, Mr. Chairman, was difficult. Uh, the, the, the positions on, on both sides of those respective bills were fixed and have been historic. So the fact that there was this effort to reach a consensus and, 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 and create some compromise uh, was, uh, was historic and uh, has led to, to the bill that's before us. In addition to these uh, congressional hearings that were, uh, that were held last year, um, we visited Puerto Rico this June to gather feedback on, discussion on the discussion draft version of the bill, which was public, uh, and directly from the residents and elected officials. We met with officials from each of Puerto Rico's seven political parties. We held a public forum in San Juan to gather feedback from dozens of witnesses, including members of the general public. About 120 public comments were also submitted to the delegation and the committee in writing and via online submissions. All feedback was considered, and, and much was incorporated into the final text of the Puerto Rico Status Act. Key provisions of the Status Act include, uh, number one, authorize a federally sponsored plebiscite to resolve Puerto Rico's political status. Two, specifics and specifies and defines all of Puerto Rico's non-territorial status options, which is statehood, independence, and sovereignty in a free association with the United States provides an objective, nonpartisan, federally funded voter education campaign leading up to the vote, establishes a process and timeline for the U.S. Department of Justice to review the voter education materials and the plebiscite ballot design, authorizes necessary funds to carry out an initial plebiscite and, if necessary, a runoff plebiscite, describes a transition to and an implementation of each status option in sufficient detail for eligible voters in Puerto Rico to make an informed choice and ensures the implementation of the option that is chosen by, the, by a majority of valid votes cast. In drafting the bill, we received valuable input, technical assistance from the White House, the U.S. Department of Justice, U U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the House Office of Legislative Counsel, the Congressional Budget Office, and Constitutional Laws experts, which I want to at this point thank all of them for their contributions. Also particularly want to thank Judiciary Chair Gerald Nadler and Ways and Means Chair Richard Neal and their respective staffs for their extensive collaboration and expertise, uh, which is reflected in the bill. You know, I want to also thank House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, uh, the Governor of Puerto Rico, Pedro Perulisi, and Representative Velasquez, Soto, Gonzalez Colon, and Ocasio-Cortez for their leadership, dedication, uh, throughout this process. And finally, I'm extremely uh, grateful to all the local political leaders, community leaders, and residents of Puerto Rico who contributed to the legislation. Political status has implications for so many aspects of Puerto Rican life, including access to resources and services, voting power, political representation, citizenship, immigration, trade, and more. I encourage my colleagues to support this bill for the benefit of 3.2 million U.S. citizens living in Puerto Rico, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the indulgence, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Westerman. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Burgess. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to testify before the committee today on H.R. 8393, the Puerto Rico Status Act, uh, which is legislation that I strongly oppose. There is no doubt for the residents of Puerto Rico their long-term political status is important. As I've always said, I stand ready to work with resident Commissioner Gonzalez Colon, other members of Congress, the governor of Puerto Rico, and the more than three million residents of Puerto Rico to address the island's political status in a manner that places the island on stable footing. 
one that ensures financial stability, repairs aging infrastructure, provides access to affordable and reliable energy, and sets the island on a solid and prosperous path for the future. Unfortunately, uh, this bill doesn't even get close to addressing any of those issues. It hijacks the question of Puerto Rico's political status without also considering the underlying needs of the island. Uh, in fact, um, as I will illustrate further in my comments, this may be the most illogical, ill-conceived piece of legislation uh, that I've ever seen. Mr. Chairman, I understand that this committee is just an extension of the Speaker's office, and uh, you basically have to do what the Speaker wants to do, uh, but I almost feel sorry for you having to come to this hearing to hear something like this as we're rounding, uh, winding down this session of Congress. Um, H.R. 8393 has not gone through regular order. The bill fails to include all status options for Puerto Rican voters. It promises sovereignty for the island while also prescribing actions to be taken by a newly sovereign nation. It continues federal funding to a new nation without requiring taxes be paid to the United States Treasury bestowing many of the blessings of U.S. citizenship without many of the responsibilities. It also provides that children born to at least one U.S. citizen parent may be eligible for U.S. citizenship during the first period of free association. And this creates an uneasy question about how citizenship could be extended to newborn children in the residence of a new nation of Puerto Rico. The legislation abrogates Congress's authority over the territories and does nothing to improve the condition of Puerto Rico's economy, energy security, infrastructure, or fiscal stability. H.R. 8393 has not had a hearing. I repeat, this bill has not had a hearing. The bill was introduced a mere five days before it was marked up in the Natural Resources Committee. It has, been, it has since been further amended as a result of backroom deals and the new legislative language was only posted online less than three hours before this committee convened to consider it. New provisions allow for domestic and foreign election observers to oversee an American plebiscite. This is just unconscionable uh, that this House would consider legislation drafted like this. Despite numerous questions and concerns, the Democrat majority has moved along as if there were no serious issues with this bill. The legislation has provisions impacting the complex issues of U.S. citizenship, taxation and entitlement programs, foreign policy, and many other items outside of the Natural Resources Committee expertise. With these issues outside of the Committee on Natural Resources Jurisdiction, it would have been valuable to have other relevant committees of jurisdiction provide their ex expert input on these issues. Instead, committee Democrats trudged forward, and to my knowledge, no serious deliberation of this legislation by any of the other committees of jurisdiction has occurred. I can only assume that this is a messaging bill. Uh, why? I, I don't know. I don't question those motives, but I do think it is an opportunity to tell the truth about what's in the bill and to send a message to the American people that this is the best we can do right here at the end of a Congress uh, when government hasn't been funded. Uh, by the way, the date on that was September 30th, and here we are at almost Christmas time, and there's other backroom deals being worked on um, to uh, increase spending. I keep hearing about how um, you know the Tax Cut and Jobs Act uh, was well, hurt the budget, but I, I read the other day where we brought in $4.9 trillion, which is more, 21% uh, more than last year. America doesn't have a income problem. America's got a spending problem, and that spending's been through the roof uh, here in the past uh, few years. Uh, those are things we should be talking about, um, but unfortunately, we're talking about a really confusing bill on Puerto Rican statehood. Uh, H.R. 8393 contradicts itself offering Puerto Rico the promise of independence while prescribing actions that must be taken by the newly sovereign nation. It promises the trappings of U.S. citizenship without the obligations or responsibilities of being part of the United States. And it is unconscionable that the federal government would continue providing federal benefits and funding to a new nation 
that would not pay any taxes to the United States as this bill does for 20 years after enactment. That's why I'm offering amendments to address uh, some of these issues. My first amendment would remove federal block grant funding if Puerto Rico chooses independence or free association. This is sound fiscal policy that preserves American taxpayer funds for American taxpayer benefits. If the people of, people of Puerto Rico vote for independence, that means they are rejecting access to U.S. federal laws, programs, and benefits. The United States taxpayers should not be responsible for sustaining the benefits of programs that the people of Puerto Rico reject. And the United States definitely should not have to provide benefits for 20 years if Puerto Rico chooses independence. I'll note that foreign aid is not in the jurisdiction of this Committee on Natural Resources, and that is essentially what these block grant payments would be. Any foreign aid to a new nation should be negotiated with the United States as a matter of diplomacy. Only then can Congress act to authorize appropriations based on the recommendations and requests from the Department of State and the U.S. Agency for International Development. If the people of Puerto Rico vote for sovereignty and free association, that is still a vote for separating from the United States into the island's own sovereignty. The United States has compacted with nations in free association. The term of those compacts for economic payments, common defense provisions, and travel and work authorizations have always resulted from a bilateral process between the, the United States and the freely associated state. We cannot bind international negotiations and agreements with a free state before such agreements can be developed. And we certainly cannot bind a new foreign government through congressional legislation. My second amendment would remove the requirements that the bill attempts to place on a newly sovereign nation. Several provisions in Titles I and II of this bill would bind the new nation of Puerto Rico if the voters chose independence. My amendment would strike these provisions as they would not be legally enforceable. There is no U.S. court that would or even could enforce provisions in this bill that propose to dictate to a new nation how it should structure its new government. The U.S. Congress cannot demand that a foreign government hold a constitutional convention or even dictate that they should have a constitution, let alone what would be included in it, or even require a new nation to a joint transition committee. Those are decisions for the people of a new nation to make, not Congress. If Puerto Rico voters choose independence, that is voting to keep the U.S. Congress out of their business. The voters of Puerto Rico should understand that forging a new nation is not something that can be legislated from the U.S. Congress. It's the work of a nation's people. The provisions in the legislation have no enforceability and should be struck from the bill. Additionally, as written, this bill could stall or altogether stop the positive progress that has been made by the government of Puerto Rico and the Financial Oversight and Management Board to implement Puerto Rico's public debt restructuring. Any responsible legislation to change Puerto Rico's political status should be based first on getting the island's fiscal house in order. Doing so will benefit all of Puerto Rico. My third amendment would require that the terms of the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, also known as PROMESA, be fulfilled before this bill takes effect. Section 209 of PROMESA states that financial oversight of the Financial Oversight Management Board will end for Puerto Rico when three requirements are met. First, that Puerto Rico government has adequate access to short and long-term credit markets at a reasonable investment rate to meet the government's borrowing needs. Second, that the Puerto Rico government have developed its budgets in accordance with modified accrual accounting standards for four consecutive fiscal years. And third, that the expenditures made by the Puerto Rican government do not exceed revenues during that year for four consecutive fiscal years. These are reasonable expectations for a government that is seeking a change in status, whatever that may be, because it will ensure that government starts its new path on a stable financial footing. According to an independent investigative report, Puerto Rico is in crisis in 2017 with $70 billion in debt and $49 billion in unfunded pension liabilities. By the end of 2021, the Financial Oversight Management Board completed assisting Puerto Rico with the largest municipal debt restructuring in the history of the United States. Currently, Puerto Rico has $7 billion in re, uh, restructured debt, and the board is working to help Puerto Rico's Electric Power Authority restructure $9 billion worth of debt. PROMESA ensured steps were taken to make Puerto Rico fiscally healthy, and that 
work should be completed. Puerto Rico should ensure its financial health before any status change occurs. I'll also mention that I support other amendments offered, like one that was also offered at our July markup that would require Congress to ratify the result of the plebiscite by a two-thirds vote. I believe this will fulfill Congress's responsibility to the territories and would ensure finality and consensus for any outcome of the proposed plebiscite. Truthfully, if Congress were interested in Puerto Rico's prosperity, we would be here advancing legislation to address the reliability of the island's energy grid, ensure its physical solvency, repair its infrastructure, or tackling any of the other tangible needs of the people of Puerto Rico. We should be treating these U.S. citizens with respect and letting a full and robust legislative process take place to address the question of Puerto Rico's political status and the many implications this question has for the people of Puerto Rico and for all Americans. This bill suffers from bad process combined with bad policy. While the Democrat majority will tell you this bill is a lifeboat for the future of Puerto Rico, its many flaws threaten to leave the legislation shipwrecked. Uh, I'm not sure it's not already a, uh, a train wreck in its current form, and uh, I hope that regardless of your position on Puerto Rico, that you'll just look at the structure and the problems in this bill and realize that there's much, much more work that needs to be done before the U.S. House of Representatives takes a vote on this on the floor. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, both of you, for your testimony. Um, uh, Chairman Grijalva, uh did you work with uh, Jennifer Gonzalez-Colón on this you know, the, the, You know, the... With all due respect to my my friend and colleague, Mr. Westerman, uh, this process didn't fall from the sky this morning. This has been an ongoing process, and and and, and the commissioner of Puerto Rico, uh, and Nidia Velasquez, de Democrat, Casio Cortez, Soto, divided on the issue of what the status should be, yeah. and they took the political risk through six, seven months, visits, to a year and a half of discussion uh, to reach the point of compromise and consensus on some items. Uh, and that's been the, the history of this issue throughout uh, this time, going back to most recently in 2010, when the same objections that my friend Mr. Westerman is bringing up were brought up then. And, and, and I, I think that what the, the, this group agreed to and we helped, I hope, facilitate along with, and certainly Mr. Hoyer's office, was that we can agree on a couple of things. We can, we can begin by agreeing that we, yes, should respect the U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico and thereby give them a choice, a legitimate choice, transparent, protected, and give them a choice. So we don't have the questions about the election itself and the vote itself. And it should be the people of Puerto Rico. We had that division, too. The people, people of Puerto Rico descent to live in this country, uh, it was an effort to, to uh, right. assure their vote. We said no. And the other thing they agreed on was that the current status was colonization. And this bill was going to be a decolonization bill. And those is why you have those three distinct status. One of them that isn't mentioned much in the comments is statehood. And, and so, you know, the, I think if we're going to... In, uh, be respectful of the of the U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico. Then look, at, we have to do is make sure that uh, they have the facts, they have the information. And the last thing I would say that this issue of status of Puerto Rico is a driving issue, politically, culturally, socially, for the people of Puerto Rico. It's a driving issue, and 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 this question of status, primarily coming from the statehood side. Uh, suck the air out of other discussions around the needs on the island, quite frankly, mm -hmm. and, and the recovery monies, the role of PROMESA, uh, the, the financial status. And I don't think that work mm -hmm. stops uh, because this, we have respected the citizens right. of Puerto Rico and allowed them to make a choice. Right. I just wanted the record to reflect that the delegate from Puerto Rico, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, worked with you closely on this Absolutely, bill. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I also want the record to reflect that uh, last time I checked, she was a Republican. Um, and um, and I, I think that's important to 
reflect as well. And um, and let me, Mr. Westerman, let me just assure you that we are working very hard uh, to get our uh, spending measures passed um, by the uh, by next week. I trust that we will. And I promise you, we will not do what you did when you were in charge of the House, the Senate, and the White House. Uh, you mentioned words like unconscionable and outraged and train wreck. Well, that's when I think back at what you guys did, you shut the government down and walked away. That, that is a train wreck. That is outrageous. That is unconscionable. Um, we won't do that. Uh, we will work as long as necessary to keep the business uh, of this government open and to not punish the American people like we did when you were last in charge. And I would just say, again, for the record, um, I remember, I don't know if my, co my colleagues remember, but, we, but when my Republican friends were in charge, you had a meeting, an emergency meeting in the Rules Committee uh, right before you left town. And you know what the emergency was? Cheese. It was an emergency meeting on cheese curders. And so, I mean, please. Um, but in any event, it's always great to see you. And um, I look forward to getting through this. And um, I now yield to Dr. Burgess. We get, you got to sit here until everybody's done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Just for the record, I voted against the cheese bill. Um, Mr. Westman, I'd just ask if you uh, heard anything in that discussion that was kind of one-sided. Did, did you want to respond to anything that you heard in that uh, in, in the uh, colloquy between the chairman and, and uh, the chairman of the uh, of your committee? Well, I'm assuming the cheese curd bill was probably better written than this bill, uh, but um, it it still doesn't make an excuse for. Um, coming together here at the end on a bill that the, the Senate doesn't even have time to, to take the bill up, something as important as this. And I think it's a, a disservice and shows disrespect to the American citizens of Puerto Rico. Well, and I'd also just like to mention, after Hurricane Maria devastated the, well, Irma and Maria devastated the island, um, I went there on my own to see firsthand, met with a number of the medical providers there, heard their problems. We actually took that up when I was chairman of the Health Subcommittee in, in Energy and Commerce and tried to, to deal with some of their problems and I think came to some, some reasonable conclusions. Um, there was also a, a committee, a field hearing that Chairman Walden organized and we went to Puerto Rico again to see firsthand the problems that were visited upon the electrical grid and what was going to be required to restore uh, power to, to the island. And then unfortunately, um, then Republicans were no longer in charge and we had no follow-up, no follow-up on the problems that exist in the Medicare and Medicaid system in Puerto Rico, no follow-up on the oversight of rebuilding the, the grid in Puerto Rico. Uh, there were plenty of opportunities that Democrats had over the past four years to continue that work, and for whatever reason, they, they chose not to. Again, which is why it's a little bit disturbing here in the very vanishing last hours of this Congress. Uh, this bill is dropped upon us, and we're here in an emergency session. And I honestly don't see a path forward in the Senate. Maybe, maybe Mr. Westerman, you do, but I don't see a path forward in the Senate for this legislation that we're considering today. Uh, and if, you know, had we stayed on schedule to, uh, uh, to this be the last day of, of this Congress, um, I question whether we would have had this hearing or not, but, uh, you know, to call it an emergency is when you're talking about is something as important as Puerto Rico status uh, and to, try to put this emergency idea around it, which it needs, it's had years of discussion. We've had PROMISA that's still in effect. There needs to be a lot more discussion. I've talked about all of the jurisdictional issues that affects many things other than Natural Resources Committee. Um, I, I find it hard to believe this is an emergency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the consideration. I'll yield back. I think Mr. Grijalva wanted to respond. If yeah. that's okay. Oh, Mr. Burgess, thank you. I appreciate it. 
you asked you asked a very good question about the prospects in the Senate, and and uh, you know the, the attitude the committee had in the not only on this bill we've we've sent seventy standalone bills that are that went to the Senate from the House, uh, and then it enters another process. So I I don't know what the action in the Senate is going to be. Uh, what we're asking for today is, is not dependent on the Senate, it's dependent on the House. Uh, because uh, historically, it'll be a very significant marker and uh, sets a standard for process and for future discussions if the Senate doesn't do anything. But I think it's still uh, an important marker and an important historical precedent to, that, that the House can set. Sir. I but, go back. Well, if I could, then since you brought it up, you referenced the 2010 similar vote that we had on the floor of the House and when when Democrats were in the majority in 2010. I, I saw that vote and I was here and you were here. Right. And and, and I and as I saw that vote, that that, that was internally symbolic. And because it was going to get questioned all the way through. What this bill does and the protections that we put in there going forward in terms of the election and the security and transparency of that election uh, tells the people in Puerto Rico, our, our fellow U.S. citizens, uh, that uh, this election is going to be above board and the consequences are going to be important. And I think that that's why the participation will be so high. That's the difference. It's the process and how we got here and the consensus to it. This is not a choice between. Uh, this is a, a fundamental choice that the, the people of Puerto Rico, I don't think I've ever had a chance to do it. But in 2010, if I may, you actually had about 60 votes in the Senate. I mean, there was a path for you in 2010 that probably doesn't exist in, in 2022. Numerically, possibly. Actual count, probably no. Well, I think, that's, I think you're exactly right on that. But um, make no mistake, I mean, the pathway forward in the Senate in the last two weeks of calendar year 2022 is probably slim well, to none. As you know, Dr. Burgess, my experience here in the House, and I assume you share it, and certainly Chairman McGovern shares it, and Mr. Westerman, is that uh, good, bad, or indifferent, we like to get things done. And then what happens when it goes to the other side, becomes a, that becomes another situation. Yeah. But I, I, I prefer to believe that if we... We can get this done in the House, that it's very, very important and very historic. Well, where were you in July, Mr. Westerman? Yeah, and there, there are so many unanswered questions about this bill, and there's so many complexities in it. And I'll, I'll try to simplify this, what's being proposed. It's a question of three options on one ballot. Um, independence, statehood, or free association. And it's, um, so if none of those get a majority, then the low one gets kicked off. Uh, then you got a comparison between the, the other two, and you have to get to 50%, but what if it was the other two that were paired together? So it's really not a fair question to put to the, uh, the voters in Puerto Rico. And also it leaves off uh, a couple of options, like status quo or you know, to stay the same. That option is not uh, one that the citizens of Puerto Rico can vote on. So are they being pushed to one of these three options? And then to think that vote automatically becomes law and it doesn't even come back to Congress for any kind of input or oversight or approval. Well, of course, there's the, the tax jurisdiction, which probably wasn't considered in your committee hearing or committee markup since you didn't have a hearing. Yeah, and, and the, the, the financial responsibility that goes with this bill passing that the Puerto Rico could choose independence and the American taxpayers are still on the hook to pay, uh, send tax money to Puerto Rico. You would think Congress would want to have a second chance to, to, have a, to weigh in on that. Well, obviously, it's a lot of... Very, Convoluted questions, which uh, probably why it would have been a good idea to have a, a hearing in multiple committees of jurisdiction. Before. The, the Ways and Means Committee should probably look at that one. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very. Thank you again. I just want to, for the record, Westman, we're still here because we're trying to make sure, because unlike my 
friends when you were in charge, we're not going to shut the government down. And I know as we speak right now, um, some in your party are whipping against the short-term CR and are whipping against the omnibus bill, which is being uh, written right now. Basically, that's rooting for another government shutdown. Uh, we don't think it's responsible for there to be a government shutdown. Will, we will believe the and happy to yield to the government. Is there going to be full funding for border security, which was well, what you, the you, fight you, was well, four years ago? Well, that, well that, what would be the reason to vote against a short-term CR to see what and what the, what the final product is like? Because you've given me no confidence that you'll okay. come to a reasonable conclusion. Well, so conclusion. then you're rooting for a government shutdown. And you did that before when you were in charge, and we're going to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, Ms. Mr. Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome um, to both of you, um, to the Rules Committee. Uh, Chairman Grijalva, when I first got to Congress, I had the honor to serve um, in your committee. Um, I was you know, a member of the Natural uh, Resources Committee and then became the ranking member of the subcommittee um, that uh, oversaw uh, Native American issues and um, the issues of um, Puerto Rico. Um, it is disappointing um, to hear, uh, Mr. Wasserman, um, you say that, you know, we, we haven't paid much attention to this issue because since I've been in Congress, Puerto Rico has been, you know, at the tip of our tongues um, in, in, in a lot of different ways from the lack of funding that the federal government provides um, during COVID, the issues around um, the lack of, of medicine that they had. Um, I also went to Puerto Rico after um, Hurricane Maria. Um, there was a hearing, and as the ranking member of the subcommittee, I should have been invited to that hearing. I had to demand um, to participate in that meeting in order to be allowed to go with the Republican um, uh, members that you know, flew to um, Puerto Rico. Um, I saw the devastation of, of uh, Hurricane Maria. I also um, saw some of the devastation of Hurricane Fiona. Um, the neglect from the U.S. Uh, to the people of Puerto Rico, who um, thank you for acknowledging, uh, as many of your colleagues don't acknowledge, that they are U.S. citizens and that we do not need to have a passport to travel into Puerto Rico. They are as Americans as, as us. Um, they are taxpayers. Um, uh, their young men and women have served in every single war alongside um, you know, our military soldiers from the homeland. Um, they have lost many lives um, serving the American people. And they do pay taxes. They do pay taxes. They don't get their fair share. They don't get to vote for their president, the president of the United States. It's a vote that we denied to them. Um, so one of my questions here is I'm puzzled as to a bill as important as this, uh, why uh, Commissioner Gonzalez Colon is not present, is not in the room. And I just want to make sure that um, she was invited to attend um, this meeting and to participate as a witness. Uh, in this meeting. Mr. Chairman. I don't have an answer for that. I, I, I responded to my invitation and... Uh, okay, you did invite her, was my, uh, my yeah, question. She's been a, I mean, she's been an intimate in all the discussions that have occurred around this issue. I, I know uh, that she has participated, but for the purpose of this uh, hearing here today, um, you did not block her from coming no, to this I mean, meeting. I, it, it <laughs> her perspective as the commissioner and elected from that island by, by those vote, by those citizens, uh, I think is important. And of all of the uh, meetings that you held um, in Puerto Rico and the community uh, input that you received from them, um, she was present at those, during those meetings and actually participated in coordinating um, attendance to those meetings, correct? You know, uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, I am a, a co-sponsor of this bill, and I have been, you know, watching um, the, these meetings and following um, the debate that has been very interesting on both sides. Um, 
And, and finally, I'm, I'm so happy that we you are delivering a bill uh, to the real uh, well, to the rules if, committee. If I may, if I may, please, Ms. Torres, I, that, that nothing's being delivered. I, you know, the, the people involved in this and this, and I mentioned the the principals there, uh, members of Congress, uh, including Ms. Gonzalez Colon, of course, Commissioner. Uh, you know, there's for them political risk involved. The need to have to compromise on some points that have been solid points in their in their positions, policy positions of the past, and 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 for for that kind of effort, you know, I think they they need to be acknowledged. It was uh, there's risk involved. It's not just a walk in the park. And and we know, um, you know, the political football that Puerto Rico has been um, for too long. And I think, you know, with HR 8393, um, I think this will finally give uh, the people of Puerto Rico a detailed plan of where they could be, depending on where what they want to do. Um, the transition to implementation of a non-territory status for Puerto Rico, um, to either vote for statehood, uh, to vote for independence, or sovereignty in free association with the United States. But they don't have to do that alone because while they form a statehood or a free government, that we, we their American brothers and sisters, would stand side by side with them as they had stood with us in every single war that we have fought. That we would not leave them on the side of the road to do this for themselves. And that we would have oversight, finally have oversight over this election that would be so important to them and their future and future generations. I that they would have um, an independent body ensuring that they receive true, correct, factual information about the choices that they have when they go and vote so that they don't have to succumb to you know, false information through social media. That's important. I think that this is what the people of Puerto Rico have been asking for, for too long. To be acknowledged, to be respected, to be trusted to make their own decisions. Promesa was nothing but a false promise. The only thing that we did with PROMESA, and I was there during that vote, by the way, Mr. Wasserman, um, it is unfortunate that we allowed Wall Street to take over that PROMESA group. There was no diversity. Diversity, when I'm talking, when I say diversity, I'm talking about diversity and knowledge of the history of you know, uh, of, of the people of Puerto Rico, of the island. Last year when I visited Puerto Rico, um, we met with several um, business partners there. They want to be able to expand their businesses without having, you know, uh, U.S. Um, telling them what they can and cannot do. Um, and if that's what the people choose, then I think that we should respect that. Congress has a duty uh, to help facilitate and clarify available, uh, available status options and ensure a fair and democratic process for them. And as I noted in my um, comments, HR 8393 will empower the people of Puerto Rico to determine their own future. Um, Thank you for uh, presenting uh, this bill before us today. Um, I have no further questions. Um, thank you for clarifying that um, the commissioner has been a part of this, and I will yield back to you. General Lady yields back to gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Ranking Member Westerman, so let me just get this straight. There's three options on this plebiscite, but one of the options is not to just retain the current status quo. Am I correct? You are correct. 
what is the reasoning behind that? You would assume that if we were to have options, one of the options would to be to keep status quo. But what, how can you explain that? It defies logic. Um, and, you know, I'm, a, I'm glad we all love the people of, of Puerto Rico. I made several trips there. They are great American citizens. Uh, I was there with Senator Kane not too long ago, and we were looking at damage from the recent hurricane. Uh, this isn't actually. If this was about caring about the people of Puerto Rico, I think it would be a much better process with much better results. You would think if all this work had been put into it, then you could get a piece of coherent legislation. Uh, we don't have that. We've got legislation that has many holes in it, that has very little logic in it. Uh, and that, uh, to me, it disrespects the people of Puerto Rico. Do you have any concerns that this bill would actually legislate what a sovereign nation would have to do if the if people of Puerto Rico vote for independence? Absolutely. Read the, read the bill. Would you like to ex expand upon that? Yeah. It, um, um, it allows the U.S. to dictate what happens in a sovereign nation if they voted for independence. And it, um, it also has features in it that keeps the American taxpayer on the hook if, the, uh, if they choose independence. So if, if, if independence is an option, it's either, I don't think it's quasi-independence. I think it should be independence or not. And just going back to the lack of hearings on this, uh, I'm correct. There were no hearings on this and the implications of what a vote to become a sovereign nation would be, right? This particular bill never had a hearing on it. There were hearings in the committee, and some of these issues were discussed. But you would think something this big would actually go through an actual hearing. Um, and, you know, there was a markup on a on a version without a hearing before the markup. So we didn't have a hearing. Do we, do we have a CBO score? Um, I'm not aware of a CBO score. Maybe the chairman knows. Uh, chairman, do we have a C so no C so no hearing and no CBO score? It's kind of ironic we're talking about budget and spending and we're looking at a bill this big that has no uh, CBO score. It's an emergency, though. Yeah, it's de definitely an interesting position that we find ourselves in. Uh, okay, so talking about the CBO score, do we know the impact the US uh, to the U.S. Treasury if uh, the voters of Puerto Rico choose independence or even free association? Like, what, what happens then with the Treasury? If, if the voters choose? Uh, independence or the, what it, what it, the free association. Free association. Um, well, there's multiple things that could happen um, if they choose... If they kick out statehood on the first ballot, then it would be a choice between um, independence or, or free association. And there wouldn't be, still wouldn't be the option to have, um, to, to keep the status quo. So maybe you were for statehood or status quo, but you weren't for either of the other two options of independence or free association. Well, now you're forced to choose between the lesser of two evils. And then from my understanding, this bill calls for the U.S. to pay for these elections. And, um, and also with foreign monitors. Uh, that's troubling to begin with, with the foreign monitors. But how, do we know how much the elections would cost? Is there an estimate on that? I, I haven't seen a CBO score. You know, the, and also there would be block grant payments. If they chose independence, there would still be block grant payments going to um, a so-called foreign nation. Let's just talk about citizenship. So let's say the independence option is what wins at the end of the day. Would we strip U.S. citizens, would we strip the Puerto Ricans of, how would you handle that if, if they wanted to that's, re retain That's a great question that the Judiciary Committee should probably take up. Is there anything else you'd like? No, we've uh, gone through a lot of questions, but is there anything else you'd like to add that you don't feel like we've hit? 
Um, I, I wish everybody would take a deep breath, go home for Christmas, and, and, uh, and give this the attention that it deserves instead of just trying to push something through um, to send a message, which I think is actually a very bad message uh, uh, with this bill. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Westerman. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Um, Mr. Westerman, I've been here now 16 years, and this has been a topic for 16 years. It isn't like we haven't uh, studied it and studied it and studied it some more. The fact is that there's been a compromise, which has seemed to not been possible until just now. So I'm very happy that there's a compromise, and it may be complicated, and people may have to make a decision between the lesser of two evils, but that's life. And I think that there's been such interest um, by Puerto Ricans to have a change of status, whether it's to statehood or something else, uh, that the Congress, in not addressing it, uh, has just been derelict in its duty. And I'm glad to see that, even though it may not have been the, the kind of procedure you would have liked to have seen on this particular bill, from my perch, we have really looked at this for a very long time. And I'll, I'll um, ask Mr. Okay. Rahalva, you know, I, Mr. Westerman did point out some, some things that he think, uh, thinks are frailties in the approach that was taken by, the, by this group. Um, how do you want to respond to that? Yeah. I began earlier by saying that we began with two pieces of legislation. Your mic's on, right? Is it? Yeah. Right. It began with two pieces of legislation, and uh, the statehood and the one dealing with uh, a status, sovereignty with, with free association, uh, a self-determination one. Totally different perspectives on the future of political status of Puerto Rico. And uh, there was no reconciling those differences. We had hearings on those individually. And I think the, the, trip, the trips to Puerto Rico, the discussions continued, and then we got to the point where those two principles, uh, primarily uh, on, on those issues, got together and, and began. Uh, that was facilitated both our office and Mr. Hoyer's office, and those discussions began. And those were the pieces of legislation that was introduced, referred to us, uh, Chairman of Ways and Means, Chairman of the Judiciary, uh, acknowledges the jurisdiction on this issue to the uh, Resources Committee, and their staff was uh, tremendous in helping us work through, uh, through much of the material that's in there. If you read the legislation, there's transition period, like in any, and there has to be, because uh, we, it, this is not about... Uh, creating an additional trauma and crisis is about a stable transition in which the federal government has a role and Congress has a role, both on the oversight side and the particulars going forward. And, and, I, and I think, but we're also, you know, I think there's been a tendency politically for people to want to the, control the outcomes of elections <laughs> recently. Uh, and if you're not happy, somehow recreate that outcome some other way. This bill does the opposite. These individuals with different political positions on this agree that the democratic thing to do is to allow the people of Puerto Rico to have a choice among those three options. Why not current status? Because the intention and the, uh, another agreement is the decolonization, the colony status that the United States of America should be embarrassed to still have in, in this world, to have a colony, uh, and to end that status, and to move in a different direction. That's why it's not there, and it shouldn't be there. Otherwise, uh, uh, what's the point of going through this process? So, you know, for me, having heard this debate, statehood, uh, some other type of sovereign status, um, and, and the kind of the debate among um, representatives who had lived in Puerto Rico. I, you know, personally, I'd like to see Puerto Rico become a state. But at the end of the day, that's not my decision to make. It's, it's for them to decide, in, in my opinion. 
And so after all this time, I'm glad to see, honestly, uh, not because it's coming at the end of a, you know, the session or any of that sort of stuff. It's, it's nice to see that there's an agreement here that I think all of us allowing uh, the Puerto Rican community to choose their own destiny. And I think it's time to do that. So I do appreciate both gentlemen's uh, testimony. Uh, I yield now to Ms. Fishbach from Minnesota for her question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I just, you know, as we talk about it, and I think that Mr. Reschenthaler mentioned, you said they to determine their own destiny, but we, under this legislation, we don't let them determine their own destiny. We give them three choices, and they are forced to pick one. Um, because then if, if, if it doesn't pass the first time, they go into a runoff kind of situation. And uh, um, it, so I have concerns about that. But I think Mr. Westerman talked about um, the real, you know, that this we need to have more thoughtful discussion on this. And, and I just have, Mr. Reschenthaler was asking about, you know, the kinds of things that we're requiring of them. And I'm looking at this, and we're going to give them the money out of the Social Security system um, that they, that, uh, is due to Puerto Rican citizens, and but then they are forced, it says, they have to establish their own social security system. So there's all kinds of things that we're telling them. Um, we're telling them what their constitution is supposed to look like. Um, you know, due process, equal protection, there are a lot of wonderful things, but I'm just saying we're telling, we're, we're saying, here, you pick your own destiny, but you got to do what we tell you. One thing that Mr. Reschenthaler didn't ask is, what happens if they don't? Because I don't see a provision under all the money we're giving them um, in this annual block grants that anything happens there. Or what do we do if, if all of this wonderful stuff, Mr. Westerman, do you? That's, that's a good question, and I, I don't know the answer to that because it's, it's unclear. Uh, it looks a lot like just, um, you know, quote, free money from D.C. Mm -hmm. with no strings attached uh, that's under the guise of some kind of transition for a country that or a scenario where you could have an independent country that we've told them, choose your destiny, but here's your three choices for destiny. And also, here's how you're going to make that work after you make one of these choices. And, and you're going to have a constitution, you're going to do this and this. Um, you know, with, with all due respect, if we've been working on this for 16 years and this is the best we can come up with, we might need to reevaluate the process. Uh, there's so much that needs to be discussed in other committees that needs outside input um, and that needs to really be thought through that has many ramifications outside the jurisdiction of the House Natural Resources Committee. Um, and, you know, if this is going to be it, the discussion that we have here in the Rules Committee uh, at the end of the Congress before it goes on the floor tomorrow, uh, that's pretty sad. And, and I agree with you that it is very sad that this is this was airdropped what three hours beforehand, and you know, and just in the few minutes that I've had the opportunity to look at the language, I find those concerns. You know, just and and I'm sure you you've seen more since you have been able to study it, but it is, uh, it it really does truly when we are considering something this big. Thoughtful consideration really is something that we are lacking here. And, and Mr. Chair, I wasn't here when all of the things you're going to talk about, cheese curds, whatever it is. What we have in front of us right now is a bill that will make serious changes. And I think it deserves, and the people of Puerto Rico deserve, thoughtful, thoughtful discussion and that it goes through the right committees. And so I am deeply concerned. And is there anything that you uh, else you would like to add, Ranking Member Westerman? Um, you know, maybe the, the chairman would be better at answering those those questions because honestly, I, as I read it, I can't figure out, and our staff, again, we haven't had it for a long time, but uh, I, I don't know what happens if they don't do what the bill dictates and they're an independent nation at that point. Uh, I don't know what happens with citizenship, uh, how that's actually going to be handled. Uh, there's just a lot of unanswered questions here. Absolutely. And, and maybe, Mr. Chairman, you, you would like to address that question about, so all of these wonderful things in here with if, you know, because it says the Constitution Convention under Section two, uh, 201 shall formulate and draft a Constitution, and then it, including due process, freedom of speech, da 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 uh, So maybe the Chairman would like to address that and issues if they don't create, if we hand them money from our Social Security system and they don't create a Social Security system, what 
what happens. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. I was calling Mr. Chairman, and maybe uh, I'm sorry. The no. witness. I'm sorry. Uh, you're addressing me? Yes, I'm Thank sorry. You. You're Chairman Wright. <laughs> I'm sorry if I got yeah, that wrong. Yeah, just, uh, for more than a fleeting moment, I think. But, uh, yeah, let me just assure you that there has been thoughtful process. There has been detailed analysis. There has been public input. And, and this is not, you know, I wish... Uh, we would have made the resolution to the differences and reached the final compromise much sooner, uh, but we didn't. But we reached it now, and it's been thoughtful. It's, and, and this bill is basically the process. To move to the questions that you're asking, we first have to have the determination. And, 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 and I think in the bill, as you read it, sections dealing with citizenship, with the transition period, under all the scenarios, are there and 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 uh, I believe that they're there and they're uh, and, and they've been there from the initiation of this legislation uh, the, that I uh, that's been around for five or six months. Has there been changes? Yes. Has there been negotiations to to reach a compromise? Absolutely. And those changes reflect that compromise. Well, and, and you mentioned reading through the bill, and had we had you know more than three hours. Um, we could have done a very a more thorough job um, to reading it, but I I appreciate the information, but that doesn't answer the question about what happens if all of these things aren't done. And and with that, I yield back. Mr. Thank you Chair. very much. Uh, anybody on our side, Ms. Gamlin? Yes, thank you. Um, and I do appreciate all the work that has gone into this and the fact that it's been a bipartisan effort um, with specific attention paid to the wishes of the people of Puerto Rico. Um, one of the questions that my colleague from Pennsylvania asked, which was one that had occurred to me as well as I was looking at this, is why the status quo is not one of the options. And I was wondering, Chairman, if you could speak to that. It's my understanding that in the last decade, there have been three different um, elections by the Puerto Rican people or plebiscites in which they rejected the status quo as the preferred option. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank so you. That thank would you. explain why that's not one that, of the and, options. And, and, and I think it's, I said, the, the, there was one of the fundamental, the two fundamental points of agreement between two disparate views on the political status question mm -hmm. for Puerto Rico. One, and those two points of agreement were uh, let people there vote, mm -hmm. and only on the island. Mm -hmm. And two, that uh, this is a decolonization mm -hmm. ask, and uh, that's reflected in the legislature. That's, mm -hmm. Another reason that status question is not there, okay. aside from your very good question. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate this, and I would hate for excessive attention to process to overcome progress on something that has been st studied and, and looked at for so many years and is paying attention to the wishes of the people of Puerto Rico. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Morelli. No other questions this panel. Thank you both thank very you, much Chairman. for being here. You're dismissed. You're free to go. Are you um, dismissing us, sir? Yeah, I, I would never dismiss no, you. Of course you would. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I want to welcome our, our next panel uh, to testify, Mr. Heiss. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, come on up. Uh, you, you, or, or, oh, you want to, oh, you're just here to listen? Okay. You're it. You're the only panel. Mr. Heiss, yeah. Okay. We get it? Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying my best. Mr. Hyde, just make sure your microphone is on and the floor is yours. Okay. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, th this is a bit frustrating to me, to be honest, because this has come upon us here just in the last few hours. And uh, I know very literally my staff has been working like crazy over the last couple of hours to try to get a couple of some amendments in. And 
I literally came into this room not knowing if any of those amendments were here or not and was sitting over here as I was getting a text saying we have we, one, we have another. And yeah, so, okay. look, this thing has just been pushed through, and I, I don't want to uh, reiterate over and over what has already been said, but we're talking about an extremely important decision as to potentially receiving a state into this great country, and we are just kind of pell-mell running through this without uh, – due process, and I reemphasize again what Ranking Member Westerman said, we have not even had a hearing on this. Uh, this is an important issue, and you would think that we would have a, uh, at least have a hearing as we go through this. Puerto Rico, uh, and I've been to Puerto Rico as well, I love Puerto Rico, I lo love the people there, but the issue of them becoming a state is, a, is an issue that must be vetted thoroughly, and there are many issues with Puerto Rico that have not been resolved at this point, um, and yet we're we're pushing down the, this path. Look, there's a, there's enormous debt. We don't we have not had those issues resolved yet. They need to be resolved. Puerto Rico needs to uh, work through those things before entering our country or before even this legislation goes forth. Um, and as has already been said, the entire process here needs to be more deliberative. Uh, this is literally being rushed upon us. The, our, our fellow colleagues have not even had an opportunity to read this bill. I mean, this is just literally, I've not read it again today. I'll be honest, I'm coming in here feeling very much unprepared from the from the perspective this came through our committee without a hearing what six months ago and and we have a markup and nothing ever happened with it and out of sight out of mind literally and here a couple of hours ago it's dropped on us that we're going to have a vote on statehood of Puerto Rico it's like this is no way to move forward on such an important decision as this and uh we just need a thought-out process as, as we're working through something. Uh, regular order matters. And this bill has not gone through regular, regular order in any stretch of the imagination. I think it was referenced earlier. We had a markup, uh, or I believe the, the, uh, the, the bill was introduced on in the middle of July. Five days later, we have a markup. That, that's just simply no way to deal with something of this magnitude. Um, and I also appreciate Mr. Westerman bringing up the point, I don't know that this that natural resources is the proper committee to even deal with this type of stuff. We're dealing with immigration uh, issues. We're, we're dealing with uh, commerce. We're dealing with oversight. There are a host of issues involved in something this large and there are issues that go beyond the jurisdiction of natural resources that have not even been considered. Uh, and that, likewise, is concerning to me. And now the bill uh, is being forced on the floor and last minute hearing here before the Rules Committee, um, I just think is the wrong way to go about it. And Ms. Fishbach brought up some constitutional issues. Uh, there's just a lot of questions. And again, I uh, would preface uh, the reality that I myself have not been able to go back and read through this bill again. So I'm coming to you. Literally, I feel by the seat of my pants, even to the extent of figuring out what amendments uh, I'm going to present or not. But those that I understand uh, that you have, uh, let me just briefly describe what they are. Amendment number six uh, basically says that uh, the, 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 my amendment would remove the travel and work authorization provisions should Puerto Rico choose to implement either the status of independence or sovereignty in free association. Uh, this actually is an amendment brought forth by Mr. Tiffany, uh, and I appreciate his work on this. As currently written, as I understand it, uh, the, the bill would allow for citizens of Puerto Rico to travel back and forth from the U.S. for 25 years. 
Um, I, I think this whole issue of travel needs much greater consideration. Um, and so the, this amendment would remove the travel and work authorization provisions. Uh, the second amendment is number seven. It would stop federal funds uh, for voter education for Puerto Rico. Why should the American taxpayer be funding educational promotions on this bill. This is a decision that should be left to the citizens of Puerto Rico. And the influence, the persuasion, the funding of that should not be coming from the American taxpayer. And so this Second Amendment that I'm bringing uh, would stop the federal government from paying for education on the Puerto Rico statehood vote. I think that's uh, uh, very... And, and it was brought up a little earlier, CBO has not even given a score on all of this. Uh, that's another concerning issue that uh, needs to be brought forth. The third amendment that I have, amendment number eight, would protect U.S. military bases. Again, the bill does not even specify what happens to our military bases should Puerto Rico become a state or should they choose what other option. We have eight military institutions. Uh, bases on, on Puerto Rico. We need to make sure that they remain ours. If Puerto Rico becomes a, an independent nation, why does this bill not even mention what happens to our military bases that are there? So this amendment uh, number eight uh, states that whatever decision Puerto Rico would make, that the military bases remain U.S. military bases. I think that's a very common sense bill. Uh, amendment. Amendment number nine uh, would require uh, Puerto Rico to pay back all debts regardless of the status that they choose. Uh, the, the debt is a big deal uh, and it's significant and again uh, U.S. taxpayers should not be left on the hook and this just says regardless of whatever choice uh, the citizens of Puerto Rico make that all debts uh, would need to be paid. Um, and again, to me, that's very much common sense. The amendment number 10 would require Puerto Rico to sign an extradition treaty. Um, I think we, again, an issue not addressed in the current legislation. We don't want Puerto Rico to become a haven for criminals that flee the United States and go to Puerto Rico. And if that happens, we need some sort of extradition that we can get those criminals back and we can deal with it. Um, and so that's what amendment number 10 would do. And then amendment number 11, the last one that, that I have that I understand has uh, been approved for consideration is uh, that uh, Puerto Rico would have to pay back all debts before becoming a state. So really before this bill under discussion could even be enacted, Puerto Rico would have to pay back their debts. So those are the amendments that I have, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Before I yield uh, for questions, I just want to tell our, our committee that we're going to have one additional panel after this. Um, so um, let me, let me uh, I, I know on this topic. Oh, uh, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for bringing forward those thoughtful amendments. Clearly the deficiencies in the base bill are, have been highlighted by the issues that you brought up. Probably a lot of this could have been dealt with uh, at the hearing level. In, are you on the committee of jurisdiction for this? Are you on the natural resources? I'm on national resources. So it would seem to me this would have been a logical place to bring up these issues and answer these questions prior to it arriving here. But like so many things we've dealt with the last two years, the rules committee seems to be the only place anything gets a hearing anymore. So thank you for taking the time and trouble to collect. Uh, I mean, kudos to your staff to drawing those amendments up so rapidly and so thoroughly, and we appreciate you bringing them to the Rules Committee today. I hope they'll be made in order. I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Torres? Uh, Ms. Reshevella? Anybody on my side? Anybody on? I agree. Kudos to your staff because they did their They make me look a whole lot better than I am, and I get my kudos to them as well. There are no further questions. Okay. Thank you Thank very you, much Mr. for Chairman. being here. Thank Appreciate y'all's time. Uh, I'd like to invite Representative Gonzalez Colon, uh, who has just requested she'd like to testify. Please. 
may proceed when you're ready. Just make sure your mic is on. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for having me here. I don't want to be speaking uh, on length on this issue because we've been discussing this for 124 years. But we've just been part of the United States since 1898. Uh, and I, yes, is the microphone on? It, it is on. I, and I, I'm, I'm here in this committee, and I just want to remind you, I am the sole representative of the people of Puerto Rico in Congress. So I was elected in, 20, in, in, in 2016 and back in 2020, and the people of Puerto Rico voted not once, not twice, three times already in the last uh, years, in 2012, 2017, and 2020 for statehood. I wish we were doing here uh, the rules for H.R. 1522, which is a statehood bill, an admission act, but it's not. And the reason uh, that it's not is we did have uh, a lot of hearings in Natural Resources Committee. And one of the issues that uh, many people said here, Natural Resources is the committee for the territories. If you check the rules of the House of Representatives, that's where all bills regarding Puerto Rico or the rest of the territories are going to be studied. So that's the reason the jurisdiction of this committee is natural resources, is not foreign affairs, is not uh, judiciary. And many of the amendments that are discussed here were discussed during the markup of this bill. And they, and, and they, were, um, uh, they were excluded from the bill. They never got the votes uh, to get it in. And one of the reasons that I, I need to be here is because as the only one representing the island, many of you represent 750,000 people. I do represent 3.2 million American citizens on the island that are always asking not to be treated as a second class citizens, but as Americans. And we do have a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans going uh, to Vietnam, to Korea, to every theater of war, but our veterans do not have the same rights as the veterans that are living here. So that's the reason, Mr. Chairman, over, over the years, the Committee of Natural Resources conducted countless hearings on the issue of status of Puerto Rico. Not just this Congress, all the rest of Congress. My dear friend, a late friend, Dong Young, who was the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, was a champion for statehood for Puerto Rico, actually fighting for Alaska statehood as well. He, he knew better than anyone else all the racism, all the issues that were brought Everything that has been said about Puerto Rico has been said about Hawaii. It's been said about Alaska. And yet, we are here discussing the same issues again. What I'm saying is that the territorial uh, status of the island is the main reason why the people of Puerto Rico still face social, fiscal, and economic challenges. And there was a question a few minutes ago about why the, co the current status is not included as an option. And that was one of the main issues of this bill. One, that we cannot have the problem as a solution in the bill. We've, we've been a territory for, for 124 years. We don't want to remain as a territory. The people of Puerto Rico voted on that in 2012. 54% of the island said, we don't want to remain as a territory. And actually, that plebiscite, I was, I was Speaker of the House of Puerto Rico at that time. That plebiscite was following the instructions of the Presidential Committee from Barack Obama and George Bush and Bill Clinton to doing recommendations on how to deal with uh, the status of the island. And those recommendations were that option of remaining as a territory and the options if people voted no. So the people voted 61% for statehood after voting no on remaining as a territory. So this bill reflects the compromise of Ms. Nidia Velasquez and I, and we both fight every time about many issues regarding status, but we finally come to agreement on this. Not having the problem, the sickness, as an option. Because if, if not, we, we will remain as a territory. The second issue is we must have non-territorial, non-colonial options. The United States has been fighting all over the world for peace, freedom, and yet you have a colony in the Caribbean just because we have a different zip code. And that cannot be, you know, that cannot be the norm. And the, the third issue is this is a self-executing bill. Why? Because you never require the, the rest 30, 37 territories to have any super majority to get admitted to, to, to the union. It's not imposed. Even the Constitution says it relies on the hands of Congress. 
Congress has the sole duty of managed territory as a possession, and we are not a possession. If we were counted and voting, we will have four members of Puerto Rico here fighting for this, and not just me. We don't have any members in the Senate. I'm the one who have the voice, but not the votes. And you know me, I cannot vote in the floor of the House. Uh, so it's so difficult when the power over Puerto Rico relies on your hands, and the people of Puerto Rico have not any vote to even support that. So any compromise that we reach here with this bill, it's, it's been more than 13 months of negotiations, meetings. I disagree on many of the issues, and I will be very honest with you. This is not a perfect bill. I wish it was admission to, to become a state, yes or no. That was the reason I was elected to Congress. It's not because I'm Jennifer. It's because of the people of Puerto Rico voted for statehood. And that's the reason in the last election, 2020, statehood got more votes than any other political party or there any politician on the island. But yet, this is not a bill on statehood. This is a bill to allow the people of Puerto Rico to express this, themselves among non-territorial, non-colonial options. I don't want independence, but that's an, a, a real option, is there. I don't want to be a free associated states like the Micronesia Islands or the, uh, uh, or the Marshall Islands, but that's international, so it, it, it is an option. So that's the reason behind this, and in, in, in principle, I may understand the reason behind some people of concerns and arguments that are being raised today, uh, but I will uphold you know, my commitment to get something done. Of course, it's too little time to, to have the Senate to review uh, this bill, but you know what? This is a historic day for us, finally getting something that we can construct and, and the willingness of Congress to actually do something with Puerto Rico. So in terms of the amendments, uh, I, may, I, I need to oppose them uh, because they do not reflect uh, the views of the people of the island. And this is the only bill that actually got support from all political parties in Puerto Rico, except from the people that want to remain as a territory. Uh, and even some people from that party supported this. So in that sense, I, I respectfully uh, ask for opposing those amendments and allow the people of Puerto Rico to be represented to have a fair share and a fair opportunity to decide a future, and, and that relies on the hands of Congress. Thank you, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much for your powerful testimony. Thank you for coming before the Rules Committee. I'm glad that um, you decided to speak, um, and, um, you know, uh, and we are going to hopefully get this rule report on the Rules Committee tonight uh, for consideration tomorrow. Um, but uh, let me yield for any questions, Dr. Burgess. Oh, I just want to thank the delegate for coming to the Rules Committee. I know it's never easy to come up here, but uh, you've presented your case very forcefully and very well, and uh, we understand your passion on this and appreciate you being here. This is uh, Torres. Yeah, I just want to thank you um, for coming before um, the committee. I know this is not easy for you. I've been in Puerto Rico with you. Um, I know how difficult it is and the politics of it. But it was, it's really important for us to hear your voice, because you're right. Um, the most people I've ever represented has been 1.1 million people when I was in the state Senate. So you are the voice of the 3 million people from Puerto Rico. They, they respect you. And um, you know I, I think it was so important for you to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reshethala. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, you know where I am on this issue, but I've got some serious issues with this bill. Um, Ranking Member Westerman really laid it out, so to go back through it would just be redundant. So uh, I'm sure we'll be talking offline on this. But uh, there's two Jennifers in the house right now. Uh, my wife, Jennifer, is in. We were supposed to be the sophomore. <laughs> yeah. We were supposed to be the sophomore class dinner, but uh, oh, alas, oh, we're here. It's oh, okay. Oh. It's okay, well, but well, 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 let's, 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 so let's move I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going right. to yield back, and we're going to move real fast right. so we can get to the dinner. Yeah. All right, yield back. Does anyone, anyone want to break up this marriage, or do we want to get this thing going? <laughs> Just wanted to say that, Commissioner, that's the best testimony on this I've ever heard, and okay. thank you for your testimony. Okay, anybody? I just want to observe that I knew that there was a better half to Mr. Uh, Reschenthaler, and that proves it. Thank you for... There's no other questions. You are...
free to go. Thank you so much. And uh, anybody else want to testify? Um, hearing none, that closes the, uh, the hearing on H.R. 8393. Uh, at this point, the chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Torres. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 8393, the Puerto Rico Status Act, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 117-74 shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. And finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit. You heard the motion from the gentleman from California. Is there any discussion or debate or amendments? Mr. Reshethal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk, and I will Mr. read fast. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I told him. Duty calls. Duty calls, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, I, I move the committee make an order amendment number two, number three, and number four to H.R. 8393 offered by Mr. Westerman of Arkansas. Mr. Chairman, as we discussed, there are concerns that this legislation before us today was negotiated behind closed doors without the input of the ranking member, a ranking member or the Republican conference as a whole. It's unfortunate to see yet another closed rule silence, um, get silenced for minority input. In his testimony, ranking member Westerman made some compelling points that at the very least these amendments deserve consideration on the floor. For that reason, I urge adoption of my motion. I yield back. Heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion or debate? Hearing none, the vote is on the Reschenthaler amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Can no. you the chair? The noes have it. Record, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desaunier. No. Mr. Sanye, no. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Nagus. Upon my glorious return to the committee, I'm proud to vote no. <laughs> it's Nag nice to have you show up. Mr. Nagus, no. <laughs> Mr. Cole. Mr. Burgess. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler. <laughs> Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. Amendment is, not, amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Seeing none, the vote is on the motion from the gentlewoman from California. All those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. And the opinion that chair the ayes have on the motion is agreed to. And a recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Yes. Mr. Perlmutter, aye. Mr. Raskin. Ms. Scanlon. Yes. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Morelli, aye. Mr. Desaunier. Aye. Mr. Desaunier, aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Nagus. Aye. Mr. Nagus, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. The clerk will report the total. Eight yeas, three nays. Mo motion is agreed to, and um, and I guess I'm going to do it for us. And who are you? Are, are you? Okay. All right. We're going to look forward to it. So, um, uh, Mr. Reschenthal, yeah, Mr. Reschenthal, carry for the Republicans. So, without objection, the committee is adjourned.